right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Bridget from Mabel. I'll be your host, and I'm joined by Fernando from Mabel and Federico from Abstracta. We're thrilled to partner with Abstracta, a global company that's been helping organizations innovate with confidence and quality for more than 15 years. Our partnership with Abstracta helps companies build a performance testing strategy and test automation strategy that gives our customers an ally to help them implement their quality and software testing. I have a few housekeeping items to cover before we kick off this discussion on performance testing and DevOps. First, you'll notice that Zoom has a control panel on the top or bottom of your window. You're muted by default to help minimize background noise and distractions, but we still want to hear from you. If you have a question, please submit those to the Q&A section of your control panel at any time during this conversation. I'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar and we'll spend some time at the end to get to those questions. If you have any comments or just want to say hi and see who else is joining this discussion today, you can also use the chat window. Lastly, you might have noticed this webinar is being recorded, so if you want to reference it later or share it with your colleagues, you'll be able to do so. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Fernando and Federico. Take it away. Federico, go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was really looking forward to this. Uh, my name is Federico Toledo. I'm one of the co-founders of Abstracta. Um, I've been working in software testing, and particularly in performance testing for more than 18 years already. I'm the author of the first testing book in Spanish, and I love to share in this type of spaces, uh, generate spaces where testers can learn and grow and, and, you know. Fernando, tell me about you. Absolutely, yeah. I'm Fernando Matos. I'm one of the product leaders here at Mabel. Uh, I started in computer science and engineering, moved into product management. Uh, I'm passionate about software development itself and where it's going, and my mission is to help teams actually adopt those tools, move fast, but then not break things, right? So deliver software with quality. Uh, just to add a little more relevant background, I was a product manager for several SaaS products that actually I felt, personally felt the impact of poor performance, right? Impacting our customers and I was the one that had to deal with it. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that uh, later on. But before moving on, uh, let me just cover the agenda real quick. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the challenges of traditional performance testing. Then we're going to dive into what are the differences with modern performance testing, with DevOps approaches to it. Uh, I'll give a demo of uh, Mabel's performance testing solution, and then we'll have a discussion on that, and we'll have uh, time for Q&A in the end. Amazing. So before, yeah, I no, like just before start... that, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to start with a, with a short story. Uh, back in the day when I was starting with performance, uh, with my career in performance testing uh, around 20 years ago, I remember that at that time there was a transition in the way we do performance testing. And uh, I remember particularly uh, a story of a bank, we were working with them, and the way they do the performance testing was to invite all the employees on a Sunday morning <laughs> to go and, and repeat the same operations they did the Friday before or something like that and have all their developers and, and, and um, uh, engineers working in the, on the platform to see the bottlenecks and try to optimize the system. But they generated the load with real users. And the evolution of performance testing back, back in the day, 20 years ago, was to start using performance testing simulation tools. And basically, this slide is uh, what I used to use to explain uh, the concept of the, these tools. And basically, um, instead of using real users, we started to use virtual users, which uh, was like a a specific kind of robot simulating the, the user actions. If you move uh, to the next, uh, basically, basically we prepare with these tools like some robots or some processes connecting to the server, opening a socket and sending HTTP requests, receiving the responses, analyzing the response times, doing some statistics and analysis. And uh, at the same time, we had the experts on the platform uh, using the monitoring tools and finding the bottlenecks. So that was the, the evolution back in the day. But even though we stopped calling everyone, every employee on a Sunday morning, we kept doing it in a very waterfall way. 
So in the next slide, I have some of the things that I consider that today the traditional, what, what we call traditional today, that was the, the, the modern way of doing performance testing 20 years ago, uh, had some issues, some challenges. We needed to wait to the day where when we ran that simulation, that huge simulation, and as it was that expensive to prepare all the scripting and everything, we only did that once or two times a year or before Black Friday or some particular event, right? We needed a specialized role or team, like only the performance testers were able or allowed to use the, the, the load simulation tools, right? And uh, it seemed like the performance testing project goal was to deliver a report. We were not, again, allowed to participate in the, in the fixing part, in the analysis and, and iterate over the, the solution, right? I don't know if you can relate to any of this in any of your experiences in the past, Fernando. Absolutely, actually. I'm just laughing here having the, the performance testing report. Uh, I think the most relatable is I was a product manager for an enterprise B2B application, right? Uh, and I wasn't personally creating, running the test, analyzing the test, but I was the PM and I was ultimately responsible for the quality. So I was the one who was invited to talk to customers and have tough conversations about the issues that they're having, right? And just to give a, a, an idea, this is a, a product that was integrated to their test automation workflow, right? So all the test automation across the company was flowing through our tool, and then we were pushing that information out to Jira. So it was real time, right? And you couldn't have performance issues there. Uh, and it was a legacy product that had switched hands. Uh, and we actually, what we did is we trusted one of the performance testing results, but it wasn't really representing what the users were experienced, right? They had been done a long time ago. We didn't know what it, how it had been done and, and things like that. So we ran into issues. Uh, we actually had to create a performance project. Uh, there was a system architect from the company that was assigned to my team. I worked with him to define, hey, here the, here the user flows are important for the customers. Let's make sure that we can run a performance test on this. And then he worked with the development team to identify the APIs. We had the team create the script. Actually, from the time that we define this is what we want to test, how many concurrent users, to writing a script, to getting the infrastructure, right, to getting it right, because you try it and it doesn't work and it breaks. I think it took about two weeks from, from that period, right? So this is already like a month. Um, and I think the worst part is actually we ran it, identified the bottlenecks, then we reserved a sprint for the dev team to fix the problems, and then we deployed to the customer, and the customer said this didn't fix it. Right. So that, that was the most frustrating part. So there was a back yeah. and forth. Hey, it's actually the wrong APIs. Let's go fix it. And, uh, and and by the time we fixed it, then then actually we never got to the point that we had ongoing performance testing because it was just too much of a nightmare to keep the the uh, the performance testing scripts up to date, right? And and the scripts got out of date, and we didn't have the resource to run it. Uh, so so I did face a bunch of those challenges. I actually, have a slide just to summarize. Uh, I think this is how I would summarize. It's a high technical barrier, right? It's really complex. Even though we didn't have a separate tool, we use JMeter. Just you know, writing the scripts, getting the infrastructure, all of that, is, it's a big barrier. Uh, you end up with uh, silent and infrequent, right? Performance testing, uh, which gives you late feedback. Uh, it was too much hassle to run it, right? And, introduce, and with that introduced issues over time. The scripts were decoupled. So after we got that last performance test done, then we introduced new features, changed things. There was actually a situation where one of the flows called a bunch of APIs. And then the front end team said, hey, let's just get one API so we can optimize this. And it improved, but the performance test script wasn't updated, right? So it was decoupled, um, so it didn't represent the system. And it was detached from the customers, right? Which is what I said in the beginning. We ran it, dedicated development time, and then the customers didn't feel the, the impact. They actually didn't solve the problem for the, for the customer. So I'm curious, Federico, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you deal with this all the time, right? How are people solving that now? Do you want to talk a little bit about modern DevOps performance testing? Yeah, what you the, were describing is like exactly the waterfall approach applied for performance for a performance testing project. And we learn to do better, right? So we can apply the same principles of DevOps approach and CI CD and agile methodologies to the performance testing um, area, right? So in the in the following slide, um, uh, the idea is 
to start talking about more modern approaches. And I assume everyone is familiar with this model representing the DevOps culture. And instead of representing the, the development process as a line, we are representing it more like a loop and we expanded our testing activities uh, to the right and to the left, not only a stage in a certain part of the process, but also uh, expanding our coverage in testing in the different areas and the different activities associated to the development processes. So that's why we started to talk about shifting left and shifting right the testing activities. And the same applies for performance. So I'm going to talk now uh, about how to, which activities we can do to ship left the performance testing. For example, testing earlier and frequently. And that means not only uh, to run tests earlier, but also to start talking about performance and to have a, a performance testing mindset when we start to design our application or our new features start to ask questions related to what can go wrong or how can I validate the performance of, of what we are going to start developing now. And this type of questions earlier in the process help to be better prepared uh, for uh, the rest of the, of the development. Uh, also, we can automate and run tests as early as possible, not wait until we have everything in place uh, for the huge um, simulation, but start with small units. For example, uh, for every endpoint, we can start automating and running small tests. And if we add those tests, those performance tests to the pipeline, we can have con uh, information of the evolution of the performance of those uh, endpoints, and we can see how uh, it evolves or if it degrades or, or if the performance degrades or not. Uh, there is a catch here because uh, in the past, in the traditional approach, all the scripts that we prepare were um, like disposable because we knew that we were preparing everything on a frozen version of the system and that we were going to run the test and then we will discard them or for forget about them, right? right? And here we are talking about running the test scripts constantly. And as the application evolves, maybe the, the test scripts need maintenance. So we need to put a lot of focus on the maintainability of the test cases and the quality of those test cases if we want to add them in the CI pipeline, right? In the next uh, slide, I'm also talking about how to shift right the performance testing. And some ideas could be to run tests in production. That, that was forbidden in the past. You know, run a performance test in production and affecting the users. And, you know, it, it was a risk that nobody wanted to, to take. But now we have things like synthetics, which is basically to run a small load constantly from different parts of the world and analyzing the, the information and probably be notified if anything is wrong or degraded or uh, um, uh, not available and do something about it as soon as possible. We have things like chaos engineering, canary releases, A-B testing with focus on testing. But if you want to work on only one thing, I would suggest the last one, improve observability. Make information about monitoring and logs, metrics, traces available for everyone in the team. Because in that way, everyone will be learning of what's happening in production. Uh, response signs, the, how the users are accessing our system and how that use affect the different uh, pieces of our infrastructure. And from that, with this information, analyzing this information, the team will be able to improve the system and also the processes to deliver uh, better quality products. In the next one, uh, I also wanted to share with you an article I just published the link is over there, which is basically applying the famous automation pyramid model for performance testing. And I think this is very aligned with the DevOps methodology because we are talking not only of automating something end-to-end -end as it was the, the typical approach in, in the traditional approach, right? Uh, but we are talking about uh, testing in different layers and also paying attention earlier to the units 
and run performance small, smaller performance tests in the pipeline uh, for each endpoint. But I'm talking about really small tests. For example, having uh, an endpoint automated and we could run, let's say, 10 threads concurrently during 30 seconds. And comparing that with the historical data will help us to detect the degradations on that endpoint. You know, and we don't need to wait until everything is ready to run the huge load. The key here is to find the proper, uh, the, the right balance, right? Because if we only pay attention to the units, we are not going to have any information about the end user experience. So we need to have endpoints uh, automated and also end-to-end -end in order to understand how the response times for the user evolves over time. Right. If you want to learn more, uh, check the, the the article. And in the, in the next in the next slide, I also wanted to share with you uh, an experience I had in a particular project I participated a few years ago. Probably you are familiar with Shutterfly. We helped them uh, to prepare their continuous performance testing uh, platform, which uh, they, they, they what they were trying to achieve with this was to detect to be able to detect any degradation as soon as possible, as soon as the the code uh, with the problem was inserted in the repository. We automated more than three hundred uh, test cases. Uh, again, small every microservice had a test case running in the pipeline, so. Uh, we could see the evolution of the performance and different metrics associated to those uh, to each microservice. And in the next slide, you can see an example of the Jenkins report showing uh, the evolution of the response time of one particular endpoint. And here in this image, I wanted to share this one because here there is a problem actually. And the problem is the assertion. Uh, and this is what I wanted to highlight here is that in your strategy for doing a, a, an efficient uh, continuous performance testing, you have to pay a lot of attention on, on how to set the assertions, the acceptance criteria, right? Because if you, uh, uh, if you set them according to your SLOs or SLAs, maybe you are uh, missing a chance to detect a degradation earlier. For instance, in this case, the service started responding with 100 milliseconds in average. And at the end of different executions, we have a couple of uh, releases in the middle, and we can see that it's over 400 milliseconds, their response time. But nobody got notified of any issue, of any test broken, because the assertion was checking that the response, time, response times are under 500 milliseconds. So the the good practice here is to maybe have an assertion closer to the actual response time for that particular test case, for that particular concurrency, and for that particular uh, environment that where you are running the, the test case. And uh, in the last, uh, the, the last slide I wanted to share for now, it's related to some other lessons I learned uh, during that, that project. And uh, it's really important to focus on maintainability if you are going to have 300 test cases running constantly and breaking the build, those test cases must be easy to maintain and, and uh, reliable. It's very important to pay attention to different uh, things uh, associated to the test strategy. For example, where you are going to run the test, in which uh, environment, or in which infrastructure, uh, which are the expected results, uh, how to design the pipelines, uh, if you are going to monitor and how you are going to report that to the rest of the team. And maybe the most important uh, lesson I learned here is that it's not only important to start soon, but also to involve the whole team. It's like to, to generate a, a shared ownership uh, associated to performance and quality. Because if you invest a lot of money in licenses, in effort in preparing the scripts, the infrastructure and, and everything, and then they take the, the test breaks and nobody do nothing about it or they ignore the results. So it, everything was a waste of time, right? So it's important to also work in the cultural aspect of all of this. But I talked enough. 
<laughs> I would love to see what you are uh, cooking in Mabel related to the new features for performance testing. Yeah, I'll, def I'll definitely cover those now. I love everything that you talked about here, and I'm looking forward to getting uh, just having a discussion on what you think about the Mabel solution here, because I think it's going to address a lot of those points. But just before I dive into Mabel itself and show, let me just explain what Mabel is, because it's a different platform, and I want to make sure that you don't get lost as I go through the demo here. Uh, so Mabel is actually a, and don't read through all of this, right? Mabel is a unified test automation platform for web and mobile applications and for APIs. Uh, so it's not a bunch of solutions cobbled together. It's actually a unified, right? Uh, truly unified platform from the ground up, up in the clouds. Why is this important? Because it, it helps not only breaks the barriers. So the API testing team and the UI testing team, they are in the same application as the performance testing team, right? But it actually allows us to reuse test assets, which is one of the big things that we're going to show here, right? Uh, so it provides a unique way to create a low test reusing the functional test that the other teams or the same team has created. Uh, so I just wanted to bring this up because it's super important. Uh, and then for the demo itself here, I'm going to start with a quick Mabel orientation. Then I'll show, uh, I'll show a browser UI test, a functional test, an API test. And then we're going to build together a performance test based on those. Uh, and then we're going to talk about shifting left, how you can take that and actually create a small version that maybe runs for 30 seconds or a minute, right? That you can integrate to your CI pipeline. So let me switch over here. Second. Um, yeah, so you can see my screen. So this is the just just a quick orientation. This is Mabel. Uh, I'm actually on a uh, internal development workspace that's you know real a real workspace that's busy. It's on the top here showing all the the browser test that we've run this month, and API and accessibility and performance tests that we've run. This is showing tests in real time. You can see the time here. Uh, it's 120 here in the East Coast and the US. Um, so you can see that activity live. And then here you can see the specific environments and test execution history over the month and, and dig into what's actually being tested. So I just wanted to show what a live production workspace looks like because we're going to switch now to a very quiet one because it's just a demo workspace. Um, so you can see, again, it doesn't have many things in here. And I, I've just run a few uh, browser tests this month. So let me show you real quick what a browser test looks like in Mabel. So I'm going to go to the tests tab, and I'll search for a browser. And I'm going to open this one that I created. It's an online boutique. It adds an item to cart, and, uh, and it completes a purchase. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to open the what we call the Mabel trainer. So you can see what this test does. And this is this is what it looks like. So this is your application. This is just a simple e-commerce application. Uh, and this is the actual Mabel trainer that has the steps in my tests. I'm going to run so you can see what it does. It actually clicks through and adds items to cart. Um, and then it says, okay, complete purchase, place order, right? And then it checks, asserts in the end that order is complete and everything looks fine, right? So it's it's a basic UI test. Uh, looks like a great test for us to use for performance test, right? This is the flow that you want to make sure that it's frictionless, uh, that your customers can complete the purchase. So we're going to use this one. Uh, this is what a UI test looks like in Mabel. Uh, now I'm going to go back and show you what an API test looks like. And we just have one API test in here uh, to get catalog images. I'll edit to show what that interface looks like. It's very, very similar to Postman. Uh, you can actually import a Postman collection here uh, and you know create one test for the whole collection or create several tests for, for each of the folders that you have in there. Uh, and in this case, I only have one get API call. I can easily just add another one here, uh, whatever I want to call. Uh, and it's just calling that API endpoint. And um, in terms of assertions, it's just checking that it returns a 200, okay? So I can actually run this, right? So there you go, results, 200, okay. Downloaded 65 kilobytes, right? You check that it passed. So it passed the test because it asserted to 200. And you can dig into the details here. But that's all I wanted to show. This is what an API test looks like in Mabel, right? And uh, and now we're actually going to create a performance test using those two. Um, so we just go to create a new test, performance test. Um, just copy something here real quick. So we're going to do something 
performance test for a webinar. You can add a description, labels. Uh, and then here we're going to add a browser test to my performance test. And I'll pick the one that I just showed. Right? I'm going to take add to cart and complete purchase. Uh, I could add data tables. Right. So if you're going to run, I don't know, 100 concurrent users, you can have a data table with 100 rows and it uses one for each user. So you can simulate different, uh, you can use variables and simulate different aspects. Uh, how many concurrent users? Let's assume that uh, Federico told us we have to simulate right, 250 users for this one. So that's what we're going to do. Failure criteria, uh, we can set uh, functional test failure rate. So if the test itself fails, right? I'll just put a 5% in there, for example. You can have multiple criteria. Um, I'll pick uh, core web virus, which is critical now, right? It's actually measuring the experience of the user. Uh, and I can say I want to do 95 percentile for any step. For example, first contentful paint. I want that to be moderate, right? Uh, time to first byte, maybe it's important. I want to make sure it's below 200 milliseconds, the full DOM content loaded. Uh, two seconds, for example, or you can enter a different value if you want. Uh, and then you can also do duration, right? So a step duration. For example, I could say that I want the uh, a specific step. I want that add to cart step to be under a second, right? You can actually go there, right? Click on the add to cart button. Say, I want that to be at most one second. So if 95 percentile exceeds that, it's going to fail the test. Okay. So this is how you set up a browser test, right? Assuming that you already have that browser test here. Uh, and then I can also add an API test in there. So let's just pick the API that I, that I did. You can also add a data table to that. I don't know, maybe it's a thousand users for the API test. Failure criteria are going to be specific to, um, to APIs, right? So it's a response time. Right? Maybe we do 200 milliseconds and HTTP error rate, I can select which type of error, right? I don't know, put 5%, Federico, you're probably gonna complain, that's not good. But that's how you set up your tests. You don't have to do anything else. Um, and then uh, here's where you set the duration of the test and ramp up time, right? So I can actually do a 60 minute and a, and a 10 minute linear ramp up time for that. Pick the applications that I wanna run, pick the API URL that I want to uh, run for my test, and that's it. I should be able to save this. Uh, it gives me a summary of test duration, ramp up time, how many virtual users uh, I'm going to use, right? How many hours I'm going to get built to, the test that I'm using, the failure criteria, the concurrency. And so that, that's pretty much just that. That's how you create a performance test. I can run this. I think if I run this, somebody's going to complain. <laughs> so I could make this, uh, I could edit and make this smaller. Uh, but actually, let me go and show you a test that we've already run um, in the past. So let me go to results. And actually, let me go to tests and open a performance test. Uh, that's the one that I just created. I haven't run that one. So I'll create, I'll open this one here, right? This is a much smaller five-minute test, two-minute ramp up time. That's something that maybe you could do on a on a deployment or a pull request even potentially, right, uh, Federico? Um, and here's the run history. So you can see how many times it's been executed. You can actually track over time how it's changed, right? The response has changed. And if you dig in to look at the results, here's what the results look like, right? So you have a, a summary at the top. Uh, you have the chart that you can customize, right? By elapsed time or, or look at the local time. Zoom in, zoom out. You can change what you're looking at here, right? If you just want to look at the... Um, like functional failure rate at zero, I can eliminate that. I don't want to look at the APIs. If I just want to look at browser metrics, for example, right? I can look at the first contentful paint and DOM and time to first bytes and customize my graphs like that to analyze. And then in the bottom, you have the, um, the run history, as I mentioned, the failure criteria, so you can understand what failed, right? You can actually open the browser and see, okay, step duration was actually 2.15 seconds one of the cases, and that's why I failed. Uh, and you can dig into um, API test metrics. I think this one's taking a little bit to load, but there you go, yeah. So this one will actually capture samples, right, of all the different responses that you get so that you can actually go look at a, a specific sample and 
view exactly what was sent, what was received. Um, Right, you can see the actual response that you receive for, for one of those API calls. And then you can also look at, um, at your browser metrics as well. So I can pick, a, if I have several browser tests, I can pick a specific one. I can open, for example, the uh, Add to Cart tab and see all the HTTP calls that work out in there and browser performance metrics and, and all of that information to help understand why something failed. So I think I think that's all that I wanted to show here. We can have a, a discussion, but uh, just the other thing that I want to show is, uh, so we created a big test, right, for, um, you know, all the users that we wanted, uh, takes 60 minutes. I mean, creating a smaller version of this to integrate on the CI pipeline, is it's as easy as duplicating this test, right? Changing the name. So I can just say this is a, I don't know, small or baseline or whatever I want to call. And then edit, it's already picking those tests. So I can just say, okay, I'm going to run it with you know, 25 users, same criteria. Probably the criteria is going to change, right, for the I'm assuming, right, based on your dev environment or QA environment. Yeah. The same thing here. And maybe this is uh, five minutes or two minutes and there is no ramp up time and, and you just want to run that over and over and compare the trends over time, right? So I can quickly create that. Um, and then just one more thing that I want to show that it's kind of cool. We have, have this concept of plans in Mabel where you, you can combine, right? The browser test with an API with performance and you have different stages. Um, so I think I want to show this one here. So in this step, you can actually create something that checks your functional tests. That's what gets triggered by your CI, for example. It first runs your functional test, make sure that it's working, make sure that you don't waste time with a performance test or money, right? Because it's expensive. If any of those fail, then it doesn't complete. It stops right there. If they pass, then it runs the performance test. And then you get all this history of execution, plan duration. Quickly, you can see uh, when when it was executed in the past. So- uh, I typically do manually, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. going to make sure that the test if uh, functionally correct before I spend time run, uh, setting up the the performance test. Yeah, yeah. But before, I mean, just if if you can do this, then you can you can really integrate and say, okay, if it fails, it's not going to waste right any money for running performance test. So, Federico, what do you think? Uh, how how would you use this? Does it address the things you you talked about? Or? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. It looks amazing. Uh, and I think you mentioned most of the things that uh, you were connecting with many things I mentioned before, mainly related to the methodology. Uh, I guess that once you configure the test, you can run from the CI engine. And according to the failure criteria you define, it will break the bill. Correct. Yeah, it will break the bill. Perfect. That's what we because do for, for UI, for API, and for performance tests. That's correct. Cool. And how many concurrent users you can run with this? On the production here, and I don't know if you noticed, it actually says 3,000 here. On the production, we currently have a limit of 1,000 for browser or for API tests. We have yeah. customers who are using more, so on a case-by-case, we'll be able to increase it. But, but for now, we're keeping that limit, and we'll increase over time. You know, it looks like it's not a lot, but actually if we connect with the methodology we are talking about, it's like we are not talking about simulating the real user, uh, user load that our system is going to have because probably it's going to be more than a thousand, right? But we are talking about running small tests con continuously from our CI engine. And for that, it's enough with a thousand. So I think it's, it's more than enough. Uh, and I really liked also the possibility to, to combine, like thinking of the pyramid, like combining the API and the UI at the same time, also have the web vitals, like this type of metrics in order to not only to pay attention to the response time, but also to some other metrics that might affect the user experience. I think that's, that's great. Um, and, and you can have different types of plans, right? And, and different tests that you trigger on, right? A PR, versus when you deploy to a QA environment or, or a later environment, right? 
or One potentially even uh, sorry say again or potentially even production right? for sure uh, one more question. How hard is to maintain the test cases? Because it's, uh, yeah. as I mentioned before, if, if we want to run this in every build, probably the, the maintenance must be something easy to do. That was, I mean, that was that was the big thing that, that we worked on. And, and the fact that we use is a functional test, you don't have to ch change anything on the performance test, right? Assuming that, of course, somebody is going to maintain that functional test that's already being right in theory maintained by your team. Uh, in the case of a UI test, you also have when well, Mabel has the AI to do auto healing, right? Which is very common today. Uh, we just added a, some extra capabilities to that. But if it's if the functional test is actually evolving and your UI just changed a little bit and the AI is able to capture that, it's going to update the UI test and your performance test is going to use that latest version. Right. It's this the AI itself is disabled during the performance test because we don't want to do that thousand times over, right? Uh, but if it's a bigger change and you've just implemented a new feature, somebody would actually go and update the functional test and your performance test is going to automatically pick that up. So, so I mean, are... it's minimizing completely the, the, the maintenance, right? Only if your SLAs are going to change, then you'll have to edit the, the performance test. You are not only utilizing the tests, but also the effort of the whole team, right? right. If somebody right. else is paying attention to the maintenance of this, you are uh, also using that. Perfect. Correct. Plus, I mean, no it's, more question it's, for now. <laughs> plus, it's also uh, you have you know single plane of glass to see the quality across UI API and, and performance and accessibility as well. So yeah, let me uh, let me switch. And folks, uh, feel free to add questions to the Q and A. We're gonna get to Q and A session soon here. So just to summarize, um, um, so Mabel provides. Uh, performance testing solution within a unified platform, right? And allows you to run continuous web and API load tests. Uh, much simpler to create and to maintain, right? The test with that reusability that we talked about. Uh, it's powerful, right? You can see all the different SLAs that you can use to, to configure and make, make sure that you're really focusing on the user experience. Uh, you can run tests on demand, or you can really shift left, right? And run that as part of your CI. Uh, and it provides a single pane of glass for, for your whole team, right, around the, the quality of your application. And I think, Federico, based on what you showed there for Setterfly, right, it, it, it's a powerful solution for involving the whole team, right, from developers to QA to product managers, to anybody who's, who's interested, they can actually come in here and understand the, the state of quality. And then the focus on maintainability. I mean, that's, that's a given here. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, please... Uh, check out mabel.com slash try. We can get a 14-day trial. We actually include 500 VUH. So you can you know, run a couple of different tests for free and, and see how this works. Uh, and mabel.com performance testing to, to learn more about the solution. Federico, you want to talk about uh, Abstracta a little bit? Yeah, I also wanted to to give a, a to make an invitation. Uh, we've been working in software testing and particularly in performance for several years with customers in the US, in Europe, in Canada, and in Latin America, of course. Um, and I'm sure that after, so so far you, you've seen a beautiful product that covers all the needs for doing performance testing in a continued way, uh, aligned with DevOps uh, methodologies. But I'm sure you have a lot of questions more related to the testing strategy like which test cases to be included because it's great to be able to uh, reutilize the functional test cases but if you have hundreds of test cases it's maybe hard to decide which ones or how much concurrency in which environments or how to analyze the the, the bottlenecks and uh, i want to uh, invite everyone to interested in working in this type of things to connect and discuss uh, because we can help with these definitions and, and this strategy. Oh, and also in this idea that I mentioned, it's really important about how to foster a culture of performance testing of shared ownership uh, around observability about uh, performance. So you can book a free consultancy call, uh, sending an email to us at hello at abstracta.us. That's my invitation to continue the conversation. That's great. So Bridget, do we want to address any questions from the audience? Yeah, it looks like we have a few in the queue right now. Thank you both so much. That was very informative. 
Uh, I think first for uh, Federico, how should performance testers look to continue building their skills and what skills do you think are the most important for someone who's looking to maybe advance their career in performance testing or get started? Amazing question. <laughs> and I think, um, well, for, for performance, even though now with Mabel it's really easy to prepare the scripts uh, or reutilize the scripts from functional testing, it's important to understand the the architecture of the system to understand protocol uh, how the system works at a protocol level and i mean how the client the browser connects to the server through different sockets different protocols how the data uh, moves from one part to the other how the architecture works in order to be able to analyze the information from monitoring tools and find bottlenecks and suggest optimizations. That's a huge part. And the evolution of monitoring, as I mentioned before, it's observability. So I, my, my main recommendation here for people working in performance is not only paying attention to the automation and simulation tools, but also to observability and monitoring tools. So both makes uh, a huge part of the performance. Then you also have uh, communication skills, uh, leadership skills, many other so-called soft skills uh, that are really important because as a performance tester, you need to communicate to different stakeholders in the team, like uh, be able to work with developers, DBAs, um, business people, everyone uh, interested in performance. So in many times you find yourself translating concepts, complex concepts to different audiences, right? Yeah, thank you for the answer. And it looks like we have a few more in the queue. I think Fernando, it looks like you have some responses. Yeah, for, for which, just uh, the first one? Yeah, we just can just run through them. Okay, yeah, there's one says, do you have, my lack this, do you have any examples reference running this test on opening PR, perhaps using GitHub Actions? We do have customers using this and integrated to, maybe there's a native integration to GitHub Actions. I think our team actually uses that. Um, we even have an image here that you can see they're, they're triggering smoke test suites and, and regression test suites automatically from GitHub um, actions. Um, we can look we can look into having reference, right? Somebody that would be willing to talk to you uh, offline. But but yeah, customers are using that and, and we are using that ourselves. Uh, well, next why don't we take a moment too to talk about Federico just spoke about how everyone is invested in performance testing. I think a lot of folks both in the development organization and outside are very invested in making sure everything was working correctly and loading correctly. Um, what are your recommendations for sharing results for performance testing and maybe communicating performance testing uh, strategy to the rest of the organization? And this can go to either one of you. Uh, I, I, I okay, guess Get the big PDF report and share. No, I'm kidding. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> the first, the first part is uh, maybe the one is more dedicated to developers uh, and everyone working in the team and paying attention to the build in the Jenkins or CI engine. It's like how you present the report in the in the build. That that's something that should be quick to analyze and to understand if there is a problem or not. And putting a lot of effort in making that simple uh, will improve the, the efficiency of the whole team. And then, of course, there are different levels or different type of tests that you maybe want to summarize or, or to present to a broader audience. And the key here is if you take everything too technical, sometimes you misses the opportunity to, you know, bring the attention to to what you were doing, and it it's difficult for us in many cases. But we need to connect to connect the results we are seeing with the impact on the business. It's like how many users we are going to lose if uh, this performance continues degrading, or, or how many how much money, right? So uh, I will pay attention to the, those aspects. What do you think, Fernando? Uh, I mean, absolutely. What what you just said there, I think. Uh, I think that's what we're trying to do here. It's we see a lot of teams getting lost a little bit in the implementation and the details, and losing focus on 
what really care what customer really cares or what really impacts right the, the end users of the application and and ultimately the business um, and that's yeah. the pain that i felt in the story that i told <laughs> we're running a bunch of tasks we did a lot of work we evolved a lot of developers and it wasn't really connecting to um, the, the pain that our customers feel. Mm-hmm. so the customer one answers and our business leaders one answer saying hey what's happening here right you running all this tasks but they're not helping the customers so I think it's really important that you can connect how focusing and investing in performance testing is going to impact the bottom line of the business. Fantastic. So looking at the rest of our question queue, it looks like someone has a question on the load generator for Mabel um, and how do we test apps behind an enterprise firewall? Yeah. uh, So currently it's actually sitting in Mabel's cloud and um, it's running directly from Mabel's cloud. For functional tasks, we have something called Mabel Link that can connect directly to uh, the customer's, uh, you know, behind firewall uh, to an enterprise application. Uh, we currently don't offer that for performance testing, and our customers are currently whitelisting IP addresses from Mabel to be able to access those applications. Uh, it is something that we're working on to, to be able to. So we're going to have both options: you can whitelist or you can use the the Mabel Link. And we have one more question on looking at performance testing trends and how do you compare API response times to maybe other API response times? Yeah, I love that. So that's actually being able to look at, right, uh, Federico, I showed where you can see all the test results, right, for performance tests. This is something we don't currently have, but it's something the team is actively trying to understand how to deliver that and definitely something that we want to, to, to create. It's a view where you can actually see over time this performance test, it's small, right, you ran it, all these times for each deployment, and here's the trend of the entire performance test, not a specific endpoint. Um, so we don't currently have that view. We have the view that I showed that you can actually go one by one manually open and compare the results. Uh, but soon, uh, I can't promise any dates, but soon we'll, we'll have something like that. And we'd I mean, love to yeah. get right on how to build that. Well, be useful. So. It will be amazing because it's like uh, not only I, I will uh, try to mimic the the graph that I showed, where right. you can also have the threshold, the the SLO, the SLA that you are comparing to, right? Yeah, and I mean all the all the information is there, right? Inside Mabel already. It's a matter of how do we present that, and it's, it's more of a UX problem and, and and time to actually develop and implement that feature. But, We'll get that. I, and I'm going to mention this in order to add more requirements to that. <laughs> 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 Maybe you can uh, adjust automatically using machine learning or, or something like the, the SLO or the, the assertion automatically according to the, the history of the response times. So you can notify if the, there is a degradation automatically without me saying, hey, I want to check if this is degrading, right? Yeah, we actually have, we already have functionality similar to that in Mabel for the functional tests. Okay. So it's actually looking at the at the execution time history, and if there is a big jump, right, we detect that and we generate an insight, which we push to Slack or or MS Teams and notify, hey, something something happened here, right? This test used to run at right one second, now it's taking one point five seconds. Uh, okay. We haven't implemented this for the performance test. It's still part of the roadmap, but it's. It would be something similar, right? Hey, let's inform on Slack or whatever that this is actually taking much longer now. And maybe with an option to say, hey, adjust the SLO, right? For this one. So cool. I'll pass that on to you. I love, I love adding requirements. So no problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're looking at the last 10 minutes of our discussion here. So just a reminder, any other questions, please add them to the chat. Uh, we do have one on test maintenance. Obviously, Federico, you mentioned this when you were talking about your earlier experiences in performance testing, maintenance can be a big uh, challenge and something to overcome. If you're running a lot more performance tests, how do you manage test maintenance with a greater volume of performance testing? Well, in the case of Mabel, it's like great to, to Fernando already mentioned the strategy. It's like having the whole team working on the repository and if they are updating the test cases because uh, functionally it's not working, they will, adjust it because they want to the functional test cases to to be updated and so the problem there is fixed when you are using other tools like uh, based on code for instance there are static strategies um, like similar to the page object that we 
uh, follow when, or this type of patterns, design patterns that we follow when we are preparing test automation. Uh, there are similar strategies and similar patterns you can apply. But the important thing is that to try to have the call very clean, very concise, uh, very well modularized, uh, documented, why not? <laughs> In order to make things easier to maintain. Uh, to pay attention to that is really important. And also then according to the, to the tool that you are using and the level where you are uh, automating, if you are automating at the UI, UI level, protocol level, API or, or where, uh, you have to pay attention to different things, but the, the key thing is to, to try to make things easy, easy to maintain, yeah. Anything to add, Fernando? I mean, I don't, I, I personally don't have experience maintaining. I, the only thing that I have experience is the fact that, yeah, we had performance tests for the, the platform that I worked on and, and they, they weren't maintained, right? So that was, that was a pain. They weren't <laughs> properly documented either, right? Uh, and I don't even think that the new ones that we created were properly documented. So <laughs> shame on us for that one as well. I think uh, it's very common. Uh, but yeah, that, that was the big pain that we heard from customers and that we tried to address with this solution. So just to give it a shot. It's a change in the mindset, right? Again, uh, we used to prepare uh, scripts that were dispos disposable. And even some tools were designed for that, right? So now it's a different game. So we need to adjust uh, to the new rules. Yeah, and every, everything is moving faster as well, right? So yes. you have time to do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of trends and re and results are you going to look for, especially if you're again you're running more performance tests, you have a lot more data to look at. What is, what are some important uh, performance metrics? For your for your website or application to look at. Well, on the on the, I'm not sure if this is uh, thinking of a, a specific platform because it's like the metrics that you are going to pay attention to in order to try to analyze their results, find bottlenecks and, and everything, it's connected to the type of platform you are testing, right? It's not the same to test a monolith than testing a Kubernetes clusters uh, or something like that. So uh, when, when and th there are different layers. If we are talking about the bare metal, uh, we pay attention to mainly CPU, memory, network, and disk. And then there are other metrics more associated to the application layer and some other metrics related to the network like the, the traffic, how the the different components are connecting connecting one to the other. But again, it's something that you have to work together with the team, with the developers, with the people in, in the infrastructure, the architects, and try to see which metrics are more important and what do they need to know in order to act and try to improve and find solutions, right? If there is a queue, there are so many metrics associated to that queue and, and typically in every architecture there are queues everywhere so i would pay i, I would start also uh, looking for the, those type of things and it sounds like having some expert guidance is always helpful when figuring out these performance mess testing i try them. yeah absolutely and i try i try to give an answer a very generic answer <laughs> to a very specific question that changes according to the infrastructure and the technology you are using. And then, and then I'm assuming you have to connect the whole thing to what's important for whichever business you're in. Is it a B2B? Is it an e-commerce, right? Is it financial? Um, what's, in, what's important for the users? What's important for the business? And what parts of the applications are used the most, right? All, all those things come into account, right? If you're working on optimizing a specific queue, but it's only, right? used a few times on corner cases, maybe that's not the, the main priority at the point, at the time. Yeah, there are maybe, uh, again, a very generic uh, way of classifying this. There are metrics that help you identify symptoms, like response times. Okay, this is slow, but how can I improve it? And then you have other metrics like are more like the causes. Ah, this uh, machine is uh, using all the CPU or all the memory. Right, so you need to connect and correlate 
what's happening in the client side, uh, in the server side, the symptoms and the causes, and in order to find solutions. Wonderful. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. What would be the best time to start performance testing? Yesterday. <laughs> After I mean, that should be. <laughs> I mean, as soon as possible. Uh, according to what we say at the beginning, uh, with this idea of shifting performance to the left, I will start thinking and talking about performance since, since the day one. Of course, uh, the, the, in, during the whole process, and according to, to your business, you will pay different attention in different moments, right? But if performance is something critical for you, I will start talking since the first day. And yeah, then just, it's just, I was going to add, I mean, as a, a product management mindset, right, there will be thousands of priorities to manage, right? So it's it's back to what you said today. Maybe, I don't know, maybe accessibility is more important, or maybe you have a ton of bugs coming out, and you're going to have to prioritize that first, right? So it really depends on the case. Uh, in the end of the day, yeah, if performance is impacting your business, then that's going to get bumped up in priority, and you should start. Don't let, don't let it catch you in the back. And that's a good segue to our next question, which is, what are some good tactics to convince leadership and your organization to start investing more in performance testing? That's an excellent question. Um, actually, that's a question that I asked myself many times during my career, uh, trying to find more resources to invest in the, in, in the performance of different systems. And uh, it's connected to the business, to the business impact. And in many cases, it doesn't make sense to run any performance test because it's not a priority. I, when I teach courses, I typically give an example of uh, different quality factors. As Fernando said, in some cases, accessibility or the how easy it is to use an application is more important because maybe the audience is uh, retired people and they are more patient, right? But then you have other type of audience, uh, which uh, they want to buy stuff and be quick and right. So maybe they don't care if they need to read more or, or if the software is not that intuitive, but they are impatient. <laughs> they need the result now. Uh, and in that case, performance is the, the most important thing. And if you can connect the, the user's behavior and the impact on the business with uh, a solution to prevent a degradation in performance or a, a bad uh, performance or a, a bad reputation even for your brand, I think it's going to be easier. So that, that, that's something to work on uh, in order to convince other people to invest in this. And I, and I think just, just to add in there is, uh, <clears throat> I think empathizing with leadership at your company as well, trying to understand what are they dealing with, what are the priorities that they're Right, they have every week. I'm sure they have tens of decisions to make on where to invest money. Uh, understanding that, and then uh, and then you, you're gonna have to get good with creating potentially like an ROI analysis of why is it important to invest right 50 grand in performance testing, 100 grand because it's going to bring a much bigger 10x return potentially for for the business. Right, and, and talking in that language to them. To help them convince that yeah this is the priority to work on now or one of the top three five priorities of the year all right and that's going to take us to time thank you everyone for joining us today you can find federico and fernando at the email addresses on your screen right now you can also find abstracta and mabel on linkedin we share a lot of content related to performance testing and we often share content and work on it together so you get both expertise experts uh, both sides of the expertise coin there we go thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you soon Thanks, Thank everybody. Good to see you, Federico. Bye, Bridget. Bye. Bye.